Born into Brothels, presented by Jillian Kohler, Jessica Wallace, Ray Golden, and Melissa Hunsworth. This movie was produced and directed by Zaina Brisky and Ross Kaufman in December of 2004. Born into Brothels tells the story of youth that are living in the red light district in Calcutta, India, and Zana, a photographer from England. Zana makes several trips to India, first starting her project with prostitutes, and then becomes very attached to the children of the prostitutes in the red light district. She puts together a photo voice project, which involves training the children how to use cameras, how to take interesting pictures, and having an exhibit that draws media attention to the children's photography and lives. In the process, she is also driven to help some of the children get accepted into boarding schools in India because she worries they will become stuck in the cycle of drugs and prostitution that defines the red light district. This movie focused on the lives of many children. There was not really one main character, but instead the movie followed several. The issue that these children are facing is the cycle of poverty, more specifically poverty in the brothel. In the world, there are 1 billion people who do not have good shelter and 218 million children working. 39.7% of the world's population lives in extreme poverty and 29,000 children under the age of 5 die each day due to poverty. Sonagachi, where the children in this movie lived, is the biggest red light district in West Bengal, India. It is estimated that there are 15 million prostitutes in India. A study on sex workers in India was done to show the reasons for why they chose, for lack of a better word, to be involved in sex work. This study showed that poverty was the main contributor for their choice to be in the sex industry. Most of them were part of families that were poor and had difficulty having secure food, clothing, and shelter. Other economic factors contributed to this choice as well, such as the lack of other jobs and lack of education. These children are at high risk to become victims of sex trafficking. They would become victims if they are involved in selling sex under the age of 18 and if they are forced to sell sex, sex after the age of 18. The children in born into brothels are pleasant children who were caught in the cycle of poverty and the sex industry. The children are often used to help take care of the family, home, and even to bring in an income. Because of this, education is not a top priority. These children and their families struggle to survive every day. In addition, these children are often expected and even forced to follow in the footsteps of their mothers and or fathers working in the brothel. As the title of the movie suggests, these children have become part of the at-risk population by being born to families that are impoverished and working in the brothels. The children that were focused on during this movie were around the ages of 8 to 13, so about preteen, pre-adolescent. The, the only protective factor for these children was that someone came into their town and offered them education about photography and advocated for them to leave the brothel and go to boarding schools. The risk factors include being born to families in poverty and that live and work in the brothel, having many generations before them work in the brothel, and the norms of the community were to work in the brothel, take care of family, and not make education a priority. During the course of the film, there are multiple child-parent interactions that contribute to the children's sense of hopelessness, sadness, fear, and anger. One of the boys, who stands out as a gifted photographer and actually goes to Amsterdam for a conference with young photographers from all over the world, is being raised by his father, who is addicted to drugs, and his mother is not in his life because she is living in a rural area outside of Calcutta. She is eventually killed by her pimp, and it is described as being poured acid on his mother. Uh, this boy lives in a household where men come to drink liquor, and he is responsible for collecting the money, even if it means that he has to chase them down. He is impacted because he becomes disinterested in his photography shortly after hearing about his mother's death. 
but Zana is able to motivate him enough by working tirelessly to get him a passport to attend the special conference in Amsterdam. After that experience, his spirits are rejuvenated enough to enroll in a school. However, long term, one cannot say how those experiences will impact his entire life. Another daughter is being raised by her aunt and is prohibited from even trying to go to school because she is forced to work the line. At the age of 14, her aunt decides that she needs to help to provide an income for the family. All of the girls in the family come from all of the girls in the film come from a family where the females are prostitutes. Therefore, their family expectations influence their own expectations for their lives. One of the girls comes from a wealthier family of prostitutes, and one girl has a twin brother, and their mother is a prostitute. But both of them dropped out of the boarding school that Zana worked so hard to get them enrolled in by the end of the film because it is hard for them to leave their family and change their lifestyle and expectations. In a study conducted by Alam and Hussein, the effects of being raised in the red light district are mirrored. It found that the mother, their mother's occupation drives them to social isolation and exclusion, and that the children face a much greater amount of risk and challenges presented by discrimination and stigma. The poverty experienced by these children affects the entire family because of an inability to provide safe housing and food consistently. Since children are brought up in families where they are either pushed to a life of crime if they are male or prostitution if they are female, they are likely to suffer the physical, mental, emotional cost of such an upbringing. The children in the documentary lived in the neighborhood Sonagachi known as the Red Light District in Calcutta, India. Sonagachi has multi-story brothels and over 10,000 known prostitutes, according to Grant 2004. The children in the film would play on the roof of the house while their mothers worked. From these views and from other scenes throughout the documentary, it is evident that Sonagachi is not a wealthy area. It also has a reputation as the Red Light District. When Zana, the photographer in the film, helps the children apply for school, she is met with many hardships because they are from this area, and the schools know Sonagachi's reputation and assume they are children of prostitutes. The movie did not give much context for the community. However, we do know that there is a community of women who live at the brothel. One scene in the movie depicts the women fighting and demeaning the children in sexually explicit ways. It was acceptable to do this in the community of the home, and most likely in the community surrounding the home as well. Most likely, these women were aware of their contribu contribution to the youth's situation, but were unwilling to make a change to their situation. Additionally, Zana formed a community of kids in the photo class. Zana was a Westerner who came to India as a volunteer. She lived in the red light area for a couple of years and as she got to know the prostitutes, she became close to the kids in the brothels. She formed a community with the kids in their photo class. From the photos taken in the class and from observing the various scenes in the documentary, the area seems to be urban and poor. While Zana was aware of her contribution to the kids' situation, she was very willing to work towards a solution to help them. This was mainly through her push for education for the kids. The lack of education for the kids in the brothels is a reflection of the kind of community in which they live. Education, says Zana in the movie, has a direct influence on the children's success in getting out of the brothels. Getting the children into a boarding school was her goal because it allowed the children to be educated while they stayed away from work and prostitution. The influence of education on the kids' lives was so big that Zana spent much of the documentary trying to get the paperwork needed for the children to get into school. Education is the key, but it must be paid for. Getting the money for school was a challenge, but Zana intended to get the children money through fundraisers selling the children's artwork. However, 
Zanny even said the schools did not want kids of prostitutes. It seemed that the schools saw them as kids of criminals who would never make it. The next section we'll be looking at is the societal context. For the social section, during the film, the red light district was described as another world in its own society. The social expectations of the people in this area included drug abuse, stealing money, and selling sex, which they called working the line. When one of the men, who was an education coordinator, asked if the children made the grandmother proud by getting into a school, the grandmother replied, if you are pleased, so are we. This shows that the older generation was more pleased with what a foreign white man's acceptance than the performance of their own grandchildren. When the woman in the film asked people if schools would accept these children, they replied that no one would take the children from a brothel. This was later found to be untrue, but hearing statements like that must have influenced the children to develop a hopeless attitude towards getting out of the brothels and getting an education. The political section. The boy in the film described his country as a filthy place. The boy also mentioned that the justice system operated as a catch and release facility that did little to stop the activities at the brothel. This may mean that the people in the red light district must feel like they have little impact on politics of their country and that no one in their government cares about them. The cultural section. The film showed parents and grandparents cursing at their children and degrading them. The children said that people tease them in public and tend to get angry when they take pictures. They have a curtain in the room to separate them from their mothers when they are conducting business in the brothel. There seemed to be a legacy of prostitution that the previous generations wanted to see continue. One of the girls in the film was introduced to selling herself at age 14. She was brought up expecting to continue the legacy and started it as a child. The economic section. The children worked in the brothel by doing dishes and other chores with no apparent wages. The women working the line appeared to be the only income. One of the girls in the film said, I wonder what it would be like to get an education and what I would become. Another girl mentioned that her father would have sold her if her sister did not return to the brothel. This shows a significant desperation for money within the brothel families. One mother mentioned that they barely had money to live, let alone pay for school. When a child was asked if she saw a solution, she replied with a simple shake of her head. We came up with a few interventions for where we would begin if we were to start working with the kids in the documentary. One intervention we came up, came up with was education. Education is key to improving the lives of the children in the brothels. Zana, the photographer in the film, spent a lot of her time trying to get the children into schools. She was met with a lot of hoops to jump through in the government buildings as she was trying to get the documents needed for the children to attend school. However, Zana believed that education could truly help the children get out of the cycle of working in the brothel. This is especially true if the children went to a boarding school because then they would be away from their home in the brothel. For this reason, we would include giving the children an education as the first part of our interventions. Education allows for reduced poverty and growth in a, in a country's socioeconomic development, according to JIAM 2015. JIAM 2015 notes that educating women is particularly important because when a woman is educated in India, it means the whole family becomes educated. Sharma, Sen, and Gulati, 2008, suggest that India needs to restructure its policies and plans to positively influence children's development related to education. Sharma et al., 2008, notes a disparity in India's national documents recognizing childhood development as important and its actual initiatives and political actions. Sharma et al., 2008, argues that ensuring quality education for all children starts when India can shift from its current normative service delivery with rigid finances to flexible need-based strategies 
so that the most pressing needs of various locations can be met. For example, more money could be put into the specific needs of children in Sonagachi rather than just allotting the same funds throughout the country. In the movie, the parents of the children did not like the idea of sending children to school. It seemed that the idea was met with hostility due to fear of the unknown. Also, parents would lose income because their child would not become a prostitute if they went to school. Ramaswamy Gibson and Venkate Swar, 2010, state that illiterate parents cannot see how investments in education will pay off. For this reason, we would include the parents in education. We would educate the parents on what would happen at school and what kinds of jobs and income the child would have if they stayed in school. By allowing the entire family to be part of the process, the kids would have another system added to reinforce supports for their education. Additionally, we would address the issue of funding. Giving financial assistance to families would allow their kids to attend a boarding school in several ways. First, the children could feel less guilty about leaving their families, which was something that happened in the film. Second, the families could be more open to the, to the idea because money would be less of an issue. This funding could come from grants, profits from the children's artwork, and donations from agencies like UNICEF and Amnesty International. Perhaps even partnerships can be created with the boarding schools and sponsors to fund the children's education. Another way we could help the parents financially is through helping them establish their own financial independence rather than depend on the donations of others. As social workers, we could connect the parents, or the kids as they get older, to a trade school through a non-government organization or NGO and help them learn a trade. This could be anything like sewing, welding, electrical work, or even media production. Through microfinance loans, they could have the money to start a business if they are truly motivated to get out of the brothel. Microfinance involves giving small loans to people starting their own business. This means that an investor in a wealthier country could give a loan as small as $25 and in time could be repaid by the business owner they loaned it to. Because the poor are often ignored by commercial banks and other lenders, microfinance allows for poorer people to have their own businesses receive loans, according to Gupta, Chala, and Harkawat. 2012. Microfinance is very effective as Kiva.org, a website you can use to donate loans, notes that 100% of the money given goes to the business owner and 98.71% of the loans are repaid. Microfinance has not only been shown to be very effective, but it also empowers people, especially women, as they challenge existing norms according to Swain and Wallentine, 2009. Microfinance gives people who have been denied the ability to make strategic life decisions acquire the ability to do so, according to Swain and Wallentine, 2009. This would empower the family to be in control of their own money rather than be dependent on others. For some families, being independent would mean not, ha would mean not having to depend on the donations of others. For other families, it could mean they are free from the pimp who runs the brothel. At one point in the movie, Obijit's mother, be Obijit's mother dies because her pimp set fire to her in the kitchen. By helping the families achieve financial independence, we would communicate worth to them. By performing the tasks in a small business, self-confidence and feelings of well-being are increased, according to Swain and Wallentine, 2009. Additionally, the families would find meaning in doing work that would be valuable. The ethical issues that must be considered when working with a specific clientele, like the children of prostitutes, are critical. The NASW 2008 version outlines the code of ethics that social workers are expected to abide by and there are a few that I would like to highlight that I believe are most relevant to the demographic in born into brothels. Informed consent is the foundation for working with clients or participants in a study. Those we work with must be able to understand in a language they are familiar with 
what the purpose of the services are, potential risks, that they do not need to participate in a study or receive services if they do not want to, and what the general expectations and limitations are. In a country such as India, Bengali and Hindi are the most common languages spoken, especially in Calcutta. As a social worker, it would be necessary to get an interpreter to explain the informed consent to the client if we did not speak Bengali or Hindi ourselves. Since prostitution is an illegal activity and the par parents of the children participating in services or research could put their parents in jeopardy of being imprisoned, they need to be completely aware of the implications of their participation and what information is shared. Cultural competence and social diversity is another major component to proper social work ethics. Doing research on the history of Calcutta, other red light district dynamics, and India would be extremely helpful when working with children like those in born into brothels. Understanding the oppression and stigma faced by children of prostitutes because of the cultural values in India is paramount because it affects their own self-image and how they then think about the world around them and their place in it. Being able to understand why one of the girls in the film was not allowed to go out of her house alone, but her twin brother was allowed, would be aided by understanding gender norms and expectations in that society. Also, seeing the value in different cultures and embracing diversity allows for a more open client-social worker relationship. Ensuring that all private information shared between researcher and participant or client and social worker helps build a sense of trust between the two. Without that trust, there will be less willingness to participate or share one's life with the professional. Again, children in this setting would need to be assured that the information they provided would not end up causing harm to their families. It is not discussed in the film, but hopefully the children were aware of how public their stories were, especially since none of them seemed to have televisions in order to comprehend how far spread their stories could become. Some of the children spoke about how their mothers have been in and out of jail because of being prostitutes, and if they felt that information they were sharing with a social worker led, that, led to that, they would no longer feel comfortable sharing. However, it would be difficult if a child was being abused or severely neglected, especially in America, because it would require a call to child line. Making sure children know at what point you are required to report certain incidents before beginning services is necessary. In any relationship with a client, it is important that they are provided services if there is a reason for interruption of services or if you need to terminate services. In this situation, if you were a social worker that was counseling or educating children of prostitutes in Calcutta, India, but you lived in America, it would be important that you found someone in India that would be able to stand in for you while you were back in America for extended periods of time. If you knew that you would only be in the country for six months, then you would need to prepare for client, prepare your client for the termination of services at the end of the time, and again, find services that would help your client after you left. Making sure clients do not feel abandoned is essential, since many of our clients may already have issues with abandonment from family or friends. I distinctly remember that before I started a photo voice project myself with students from an alternative school near Dickinson, our professor told us how important it is to make our weekly meetings with the students because they would lose confidence in, in us if we did not attend regularly. Typically, the students have already been disappointed by many of the adult figures in their life, and providing them consistency in our presence was a big part of building rapport. I think everyone can agree that as a social worker, we should do our best to avoid causing distress in the lives of our clients that may be more vulnerable than others, suffering from various trauma or mental health issues, or hesitant to participate in services to begin with. In the study on re children of prostitutes in Bangladesh, the researchers included an ethics and consent section in their paper. The section reads as follows. All the activities of this study were consistent with recognized codes of research ethics, 
rooted in a declaration of Helsinki. Um, potential participants were provided with information sheet in Bengali, which was read to them, and confirmation was taken that participants fully understood the nature of the study. Sufficient time was allowed for considering participation, and then a consent form was provided to the women and children who agreed to participate in the study. Due to its sensitive nature, acknowledgement was made that there would be no opportunity to blame the participating sex workers, nor there would be any threat or risk towards the children. The conduct of the data collection was framed around sensitivity, tact, empathy, and ensuring that the participants' needs were met. I believe this approach to doing work with children of prostitutes, prostitutes themselves, and their family is the best, and it is, particip it is perfectly articulated. It goes back to the first in the Code of Ethics about a commitment to one's client. 